Thank you, Kate. Thank you, everyone. Uh, rock and roll. I just hope we, we, we tumble through the subjects and, uh, uh, and we'll tumble through the subjects amongst ourselves uh, with these three wonderful people and then we'll open up to you, to you in, a, in a 45 minutes or 50 minutes. Uh, but roughly uh, to my left is Andrew Moody, who you of course know, who's a, an actor and a playwright. Uh, I need to say nothing more about that. I'm going to ask each one, each one of these wonderful people to my left to take one of the historical works that they've written and briefly thumbnail it so we have a reference point to go back to uh, as we debate stuff. Uh, Mark Brownell in the middle. Uh, have you ever acted? No. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you have? I'm we sorry. Oh, you've acted together? Yes, oh, my gosh. Yes, he was a fellow to my Brabantio. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Okay. That's right. <laughs> so every, every <laughs> exactly. We're all, uh, have you major acted, Molly? Oh, many times, yes. <laughs> so, okay, so it's either a, a table full of actors who turn to writing. <laughs> what does that say about writing? Uh, so, uh, I'm hoping you're going to talk about the real McCoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Mark, you'll talk about The Iron Road, which is currently shooting now in China as a miniseries. And Molly Tom at the far left, who uh, hopefully will talk about The Bush Ladies, who she says she didn't write, she assembled. <laughs> but that's what George Luscombe did. He assembled wonderful pieces of theater. So mm -hmm. I'd say she writes. So shall we start, Andrew, with you? Uh, so uh, <clears throat> I've got a little spiel about The Real McCoy, uh, so you'll forgive me because I, I actually really like it. So. Anybody heard the expression the real McCoy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Where do you think it came from? Anybody? Anybody? Want to guess? Well, you know, come on. Ah, you see, that's what I thought. Uh huh. Because I was doing a play, I was acting in a play out in Calgary afterwards, and somehow I was using the phrase the real McCoy, and the person I was talking to said, Well, you know where that phrase came from? And I said, Well, the, the Hatfields and the McCoys, right? And he said, No, no. It actually came from a black inventor from Colchester, Ontario. His name was Elijah McCoy. His father was a runaway slave. He fought in the Upper Canada Rebellion. The Queen, because the, we won, uh, the Queen said, you know what, for your service we'll give you some land in Colchester. They gave him 20 acres of land. He raised uh, 13 children, one of whom was Elijah McCoy. Elijah McCoy was sent off to Edinburgh, Scotland to study under William Rankin, who was one of the foremost experts in thermodynamics in Scotland at the time. Comes back, but because Elijah McCoy is a Negro, he can't get any work as an actual engineer in America. We went out to America because that's where all the big stuff was happening with trains. So he works as a fireman, stoking the fires on the trains. And the thing about train technology, which is hard to imagine now, at the time you'd have to stop it, stop the train to oil it up, because some, for some reason the technology used to oil up steam engines was just really inferior. Steam is very corrosive to metal. So he's, you know, shoveling whatever wood or coal into the train, and he goes, I bet you, you know, you could, if you had a lubricating cup, and it shoved, you know, oil throughout the entire system, you could keep the train going, and you'd never have to stop it to oil up. So he made this lubricating cup, but of course other people were making lubricating cups, but his were particularly well made. So engineers, when they came to a store, they would ask for the real... <laughs> exactly! <laughs> <laughs> but... It gets better. <laughs> so, he, uh, the, the, his m cups are, are made and they're produced throughout uh, the world. Uh, however, because he's a Negro, people would stop buying it if they found out that a black person invented it. So nobody found out that he was the inventor. He died in an insane asylum. Nobody realized he was the real. <laughs> Thank you. That's the play. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's it. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a spiel I've been working you on for years. I'm sorry. You have to Can you top this? Yeah, go. Yeah. I have to follow. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I was uh, brought on as a librettist uh, to a project by Tapestry Music uh, many years ago, thanks to this woman here, Molly Tom. I was the, the last surviving librettist. <laughs> I think there was about uh, four or five before me. Uh, and I was teamed with a composer by the name of Chan Kanin, who wanted to do a... Uh, a very large sweeping uh, opera about the uh, Chinese railway workers during the building of the CPR in BC. Uh, it took us, took me, I think, about six years, but Kanin, I think, about 12 years of, uh, of writing, and it finally sort of culminated in a show, which I believe was uh, uh, staged at 2001 uh, at the Elegant Theatre for about nine performances. Uh, and uh, that's about it. We won a Best Musical Dora for it, and. Uh, 
It's since gone on to, uh, the story has gone on to be a CBC miniseries, and uh, there, are, there is talk about uh, a remount in, in BC for the Olympics. Mm -hmm. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. But that's that. Okay. And I represent another uh, visible minority, women. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, the Negro, the Chinese, and the women. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, the Bush Ladies is, uh, as Bob said, uh, not a, a, an original play. It's an assembly of writings by four uh, famous Canadian uh, pioneer writers. Susanna Moody, uh, Catherine Parr Trail, her sister, Anne Langton, who was a neighbor in the Peterborough area. And those three were, came to be known as the Peterborough Ladies. So and the first question I want to put on the floor then is why history? Why do you, why do you three people to my left write from history? Aren't we, don't we write fiction? Don't we create in the theater? Why do we reach back to uh, events that happened? Uh, speaking personally, I uh, have never been a writer who creates from the, the internal. I always look to external influences. And in my historical stuff, uh, it's just stuff that I've, I've heard. I've heard on the radio, with, or I've been called in as a hired gun. Um, it's the thing that, uh, it, it, in a really weird, sort of cynical way, it's, it's better to do history because it lasts longer. <laughs> contemporary, contemporary Canadian drama will only be contemporary for so long. Also, so Go ahead. Well, uh, in, in the case of the Bush ladies, we found that, that uh, the immigrant experience was very resonant with people today. You know, people who came from, from far away were having the same kind of culture shock, the same kind of dashed hopes, and the same need for reconciliation. So it, it became a kind of contemporary piece as well. But I also think that uh, that question resonates when you start writing something historical too. I think uh, as a writer, I know I, when I start writing something that's based on history, I go, well, why am I writing this though? I'm, and I think it's just because something, you come across something in history that resonates for you on mm -hmm. some level. And you, you might know why, you might have no idea why. And then because it resonates with you, you think, well, I think it'll resonate with other people. But I, th I honestly, I mean, I'm, I'm constantly plagued by that question, like why? When you come across something historically, you think, well, why is it that I want to write this? And mm -hmm. But that's and peculiar to you, uh, to yeah. Andrew, though, because there's so much that happens in the street that you could resonate with you. That's there's true. So much well, I write about that, too. <laughs> so I do that, too. Good, but you write, you write more about history. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, and I think, uh, you know, I, I, like... I think there is something about history that uh, resonates, and I think you're right that there are certain. Uh, that was one of the reasons I think why Shakespeare would take things from the past, from the from, mm -hmm. from the far past. I think uh, there's, there's more liberty to be had. Yeah, and the further back in history you go, the better. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. You don't want to write there's about. No, there's no relatives around to sue you. Yeah, like that was the thing that drove me nuts about the Tommy Douglas story, where somebody I can't remember who got upset about their grandparent being maligned or something yeah and I thought look, it's a story we need like when we're g pulling together things from history to create a mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. if we just give you information trust me you'll mm -hmm. just you'll leave y y you come to a, a meeting like this for information like if you want as an audience if you're looking for information you might come to a panel or something but if you want to see a story then mm -hmm. you come to drama the, the Tommy Douglas thing is an interesting point because people as an audience they approach it as this is the gospel truth they may not think that, but mm. people watching it on TV think, oh, it's real, you know, yeah. just as, as the way, you know, your you people think you're the character on the street or whatever. Mm -hmm. The Tommy